But before we read it, I just wonder if you can recall with me that time before lockdown when we used to meet together as a church. We used to all be in the same room. Now, do you remember there were those times where we'd be together and the sermon was happening and it was one of those sermons that gripped you and you felt really uh, at the authority, really, of the person speaking. And then someone with a demon came in and started shouting at the preacher. Do we all remember that moment? No, I'm getting blank looks from everyone here, so I'm assuming that you at home don't remember that moment either. It sounds odd, it sounds bizarre, and I don't think we'd know what to do, really. But that is exactly what happens in this story that we're looking at today. So let's look at how Jesus responds to this situation. So we're in Luke chapter 4, verses 31 to 37. And it says this, And he went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbath. And they were astonished at his teaching, for his word possessed authority. And in the synagogue, there was a man who had the spirit of an unclean demon. And he cried out with a loud voice, Ha! What do you have to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him saying, be silent and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him down in their midst, he came out of him, having done him no harm. And they were all amazed and said to one another, what is this word? For with authority and power, he commands the unclean spirits and they come out. And reports about him went out into every place in the surrounding region. Let's pray as we respond to God's word. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have revealed yourself, Lord, that you have sent Jesus into the world. And Lord Jesus, we thank you that we see your power and your authority even over the forces of darkness. Lord, as we unpack this um, passage, give us your spirit to understand it, to apply it, to savor it. And Lord, bless me as I teach it, I pray. Amen. So, First, let's understand this passage in its context. So historically, this actually comes before, sorry, this comes before what Andy uh, preached about last week. So in terms of how events actually happened, Jesus first did this and then later on went down to Nazareth as Andy preached on. But Luke has put it in this order for a purpose. And as Andy said last week, the purpose is to set the theme for Jesus' ministry. And so last week we saw Jesus establish the theme that we're supposed to bear in mind for every other story. And that theme was Jesus has come to fulfill that prophecy in Isaiah, to have the spirit of the Lord rest on him, to bring liberation to the captives, to, to rescue those who are oppressed, to declare the year of the Lord's favor. And so Jesus now, we're supposed to read this story in light of that, to read about Jesus' authority, his mission to rescue from the powers of darkness, to heal the brokenhearted. And really this passage focuses on one topic, which is the authority of Jesus. But we see that in two ways. The first thing that we read about in the first few verses is that he has authority in his teaching. He has authority with the way he handles the word of God. People are blown away, it says. They are, they are uh, questioning among themselves, who is this? He speaks with authority. The way he teaches captivates them. And it's the same as what we saw last week when he picks up Isaiah. It's as though the people are saying, he handles this book like he's the one who wrote it. He handles it like it's his. He handles the scriptures in the same way an artist can handle their painting. See, when we come to paintings, lots of people have different interpretations. It, it might mean this. To me, it says this. But only the artist can come and tell you, no, actually, this is what I was thinking when I made it. And so Jesus, in the same way, comes to the scriptures as an artist comes to his painting and says, this is what it means. And so he speaks with authority because it's his word. There's no uh, 
just pontificating or giving opinions. He's not just giving nice sayings. He's teaching his word. The people at the time would have been particularly blown away by this, as sometimes we can be today if you've uh, grown up hearing people just pontificate in the pulpit. But particularly among the Jewish rabbis, there was this sense in which you could never say anything except what had already been said before. So a phrase from a certain rabbi recorded in the second century is, uh, nor have I ever in my life said a thing which I did not hear from my teachers. Now, there may be an irony there because maybe that's his first original saying, but even that's unlikely because we have loads of other rabbis quoting the same thing. It was just a constant repetition of what had already gone on before. There was no sense in which there was authority in what was being said. There was no sense that there was fact from God. It was just, well, I had someone else say this, and so I'm going to pass it on. They spoke in endless chain references, constantly just sharing opinions. But Jesus comes and does something very different. Jesus comes and speaks with authority. He needs no commentary. He needs no teacher greater than himself. He needs no one to help him. He is the author. And so there is no authority higher than himself that he can go. He is the author. And so he speaks with authority. He speaks as though the scriptures actually have something to teach us. That they're not just a, a seeds for debate. They're not just seeds for conversation. Oh, maybe it means this. Maybe it means that. For generation after generation, he speaks as though truth is in the word. It's not full of mumbo jumbo. It's not full of phrases that are supposed to be tripping us up. There is a clarity to scripture and Jesus preaches that clarity. And with that clarity comes scripture's ability to challenge us in the same way Jesus challenges his hearers through the scriptures. A clear command is what resonates with us. It makes us feel the authority. I think of when Evangeline is being particularly naughty. Anna and I will look at her and we say, Evangeline, no. She doesn't speak. She doesn't, uh, she doesn't have conversations with us. But when she hears no, she stops. She often cries and isn't happy about it, but she knows that we are setting a boundary. In the same way, the scriptures speak with clarity. And Jesus doesn't pretend that it's all just a gray area. They are clear. And so there's kind of two things that we can really take from Jesus' approach here. And and they're they're very practical for us, both as uh, listeners, but also uh, those of us who preach. The first thing is we should and we must read, preach, chew on scripture in the same way Jesus does. It speaks truth. It has authority. 90% of the time, the meaning is very plain. There are, of course, hard passages. But 90% of the time, scripture challenges us. Often, the passages that people refer to as hard passages are not hard. We just don't want them to say what they say. And that is something that has to challenge us. The meaning is plain. This isn't a book of opinions. It's God's word. So don't treat it like the rabbis and the scribes did. But the second sense that we can take from Jesus' um, from Jesus' approach, or the second uh, application, is that we cannot read, preach, and teach the Bible like Jesus does. It's not our word to handle. It's not my book. I cannot say, oh, it means this when Jesus has said the opposite. I need commentaries. We need to be feeding off each other, to be seeing what other people have said, not because they are our authority, but because it's a sense of humility as we come to it. We need to study it. Jesus speaks to us through it because it's his to handle, not ours. So the first thing that we see is Jesus has authority in the way he teaches the word. And that grips them and it should grip us. Because as I say, as we open the scriptures, we are hearing Jesus speak to us on every single page of the Bible. Jesus speaks to you. But then we move from his authority in word 
to his authority in action. Now, they're not two distinct things. They are a stream that flows into each other. His authority in action is seen as he speaks to the powers of darkness. Now, today, if I were to use the word demons, a demon-possessed man, there tends to be two swings. And on one side, there's the view that demons are everywhere. In the Middle Ages, this was very popular. Uh, demons are the cause of bad weather. Demons are the cause of you can't find your keys. If, everything, if anything goes wrong, blame demons. And there's, there's parts of the world where this is very much the mindset. If anything happens, there are demons. If your toaster is burning your toast, you need to exorcise the demon from your toaster. In the Middle Ages, they had taught that demons were the cause of um, bowel movements and, and gas. And so uh, many Christians kind of thought themselves as having problems with demons whenever they passed wind. And so there's a great quote from um, Martin Luther after he came to know uh, the Lord Jesus and he came to really have an understanding of the gospel. And he came to realize that the devil doesn't have power over him in the way that it's often talked about. He said this, but I resist the devil and often it is with a fart that I chase him away. Some fantastic Martin Luther there. He, he's saying that people may say they have uh, the power over me, but they don't. But at the same time, people today often think as though demons were what everyone thought back then. But nowadays, we don't really think about demons. But actually, that's not true. Since the 1950s, books on demons have shot through the roof in sales. People still today are obsessed with this notion that there are demons everywhere that the powers of darkness are under every bad thing that goes wrong. Even amongst some Christians, you get this concept that every temptation that's given into, every sin that happens, every bad thing, oh, it's not actually my fault, it's demons. You can, you know, you can picture the story of someone saying, I cheated on my wife, but you can't blame me, it was a demon. No, actually, maybe you sinned. <laughs> we shouldn't just put everything on demons. I heard the story this week of a Christian marriage counsellor who had quite a super spiritual couple come in for counselling who, when they got into an argument, would start calling out the demons in each other's life. Uh, so they would look at each other and they'd, the argument would be getting more and more heated and then one of them was saying, I call out the demon of anger and jealousy in your life. And the other would return, I call out the demon of bitterness in yours. Now, at that point, you have to think that maybe it wasn't demons that were the problem. It was just that they didn't like each other very much. But this marriage counselor told this story, and I, I thought it was so fascinating. In fact, this was the same um, people who exorcised the demons from the toaster that I mentioned earlier. They found demons everywhere. That's one swing that people often fall into. Demons everywhere. Burnt toast, farting, sinning, demons but the thing about humans is when we hear something that's wrong, we often go right to the other side. And so the other swing is that there are demons nowhere. Demons are, the concept is a pre-scientific uh, superstition to explain bad things. But nowadays we know that there are naturalistic explanations for everything. Sometimes that whole concept of, you know, a, a, an evil spirit sounds kind of embarrassing in our modern world. It's just a, an ancient way of describing various illnesses. You read about some of the demon possessions that happened in the New Testament, and you say, we didn't have a demon. He just had, he was having an epileptic fit. And so we often try and just naturalize or demythologize a lot of these things. Even among Christians, we don't think it's odd to believe in God. So clearly there's a spiritual realm. And yet, to go with demons and, and that kind of spiritual realm, that seems a bit too far. And so that's the other swing, demons nowhere. Now, the thing about swings is, as it tends to be, is both are unhelpful. Both take us too far away from the truth. The Bible is clear. There are powers of darkness. There are demons. They do operate and exist. But at the same time, they're not talked about often. 
in the Bible. And the fact that there are stories like this actually is very significant. I wonder how many times you think in the whole Bible, in all 66 books, how many times the word demon is used. It's used 73 times, in, no, 76 times, sorry, in the whole Bible. 76 times in the whole Bible. 64 of those times, 64 out of 76, are in the Gospels in the context of Jesus' ministry. So why is that? Why do we find so many in the context of Jesus' ministry? Because when a kingdom is being assaulted, the army all musters together. When a kingdom is on uh, the defensive, because a, a greater kingdom is coming against them, they put all the army in one place. And so in Jesus' ministry, Satan knows that the kingdom of darkness is being assaulted because Jesus has come. That's what we read last week. He has come to give liberation to the captives. He's come to set free those who are oppressed. And so the army is being mustered together, but Jesus is coming to break the kingdom of darkness. And so the demons come out. That's the kind of threat that Jesus is to the kingdom of darkness. That just the presence of that one person brings that many demons, that many forces of darkness together to one place to combat him. And yet none of them succeed. One person encounters all of them and overcomes every single one. Jesus here speaks with authority over them because he has authority over them. He is their superior in every single respect. The army all mustered together in one place does not even have 1% of the strength needed to overcome this attacking force. And what's interesting is the difference between demons and humans is that humans fail to recognize Jesus' power and so ignore him. But demons know Jesus' power and so are terrified of him. And so what we see here is that just as Jesus has demonstrated his authority in word, is he now does it in action. Jesus demonstrates that he is the authority and he drives this unclean spirit out of this man. He gives liberation to the captive. He shows the demons who's boss. It's funny because I think we often kind of have this, these like three tiers of God's sovereignty, if you like, three tiers of God's control. You know, he has the angels. Now they're his army and they're always doing his will. They do what he wants. That's the first tier. That's where God has the most control. And then there's humans. And we really like to talk about free will. We really like to say, yeah, God's in control, but we all make our own decisions. And then uh, lastly, there's the demons. Now these are just an unruly bunch that Jesus really can't get a grip on. They're the kind of the three levels. In control, kind of in control, wish he could get a control on them. But actually, what we see here is that Jesus has all authority, that there aren't three tiers. He is in control, and so he has authority over the powers of darkness. All the powers of darkness. Now, the reason I want to specify that he has control over all the powers of darkness is because Satan has more in his toolbox than just demons. Satan knows what to use to get you. In the Screwtape Letters by C.S. Lewis, a fantastic book, if you've not read it, I really recommend it. He has this concept of magicians and materialists. There are the people who are obsessed with the spiritual realm, and there are people who believe nothing more than the natural exists. Now, what does Satan do? Does he just have one size fits all? No. The magicians, the ones who are obsessed with the spiritual realm, it's their obsession that is going to stop them from turning to God. And so what Satan needs to do is bombard them with more spiritual stuff to get them going down the wrong path. But for the person who believes there is nothing more than this, what's going to turn them to God is seeing there is more than this. And so the last thing Satan wants to do is expose them to the spiritual realm. 
Satan is wise and he knows what to use to turn you from Christ. So perhaps as you listen, as you read this story, you can think, well, I don't think I have a demon. I don't think I know anyone who has a demon, but I know there is something which Satan has over me, which he is using to grip me in fear. There are many people, I think, who are uh, attacked by the devil, but because it's not uh, like what we see in Jesus' ministry, because it's not uh, requiring you know, an exorcism where a priest comes around with holy water or anything like that, they undermine the significance of it. And they go on in fear. They go on feeling um, under that power somehow. We do need to know that Jesus has authority over all the powers of darkness. However they should manifest, Jesus can rebuke them. Jesus is the one with authority. Now, in our culture, perhaps we do need to be more aware of spiritual warfare. Perhaps it does in, sometimes involve the work of demons and being cynical towards it obviously isn't going to help anymore. Evangeline has this book given to her by her uncle Tom called There's No Such Thing as a Dragon, where a boy wakes up and there's a dragon at the end of his bed and he says, Mum, there's a dragon at the end of my bed. And his mum says, there's no such thing as a dragon. And the dragon gets bigger. And then later on throughout the day, Mum, the dragon is this, that, and that. It needs food. There's no such thing as a dragon. And so it gets bigger. And by the end of the story, the dragon is so big that it's filled up the whole house. And finally they admit, there is a dragon. And suddenly the dragon starts to decrease in size and goes back to just being a little dragon at the end of the bed. And the moral of the story is, obviously, for children, the more you ignore a problem, the greater it's going to grow, the, the more um, in the corner you're going to end up. And so we shouldn't be going, well, there's no such thing as demons, there's no such thing as any of those things, because if they do creep up, we're going to be in denial. And so we do need to be ready but at the same time, I don't say that because you're going to find some demons soon. If someone comes into this, to, to our church, with, obviously with a demon, we should deal with it. We should know how to deal with it. But the point I want to make is Satan can be far more subtle than that. And there may be other dragons which we're ignoring. There may be other times that we're saying there's no such thing as a dragon. And they need to be dealt with. We don't need to be enchained to fear or to darkness, Jesus has come to bring liberation to the oppressed. If you do feel enchained to something, please do talk to the elders. Please get in touch with the church. We don't have the authority to deal with it, but Jesus does. The same Jesus that drove out this demon is the same Jesus that is present in his church. And so please do turn to him. His authority, he speaks to us in this and because he speaks to us in this, he acts in power. Jesus has the authority, not them. And the last thing I just want us to look at as we finish off is that we specifically see this, this demon is referred to as an unclean demon. Now, the funny thing is you might think, well, surely every demon is unclean. But this passage is teaching us that there is an unclean and there is a holy. Jesus is the holy one. The demon is the unclean. Now, the reason it gives us that comparison is just so we know who we're dealing with. That we want to be with the holy one. We want to side with the one who has authority over it. He cannot be caught in their grasp because he is holy. He is set apart. But the other thing we miss is that this crowd is wowed by Jesus. And yet the demon says, I know who you are. The crowds are missing who he is, but the demon knows who he is. So don't marvel at this wonderful man's teaching, at the things he says, at, at you know, his, his amazing commands of love. They are amazing, and he is an amazing teacher, but because of who he is. So don't miss Jesus. He has the authority because he is the Holy One. He is the Holy One of Israel, though in the humble form of a man. And so... The challenge this morning for us is to leave the unclean, to leave the powers of darkness and to cleave to the Holy One, to be found in Jesus. 
he is able to rebuke all darkness, all uncleanness, all unholiness from you and from us and to make us his. He has the power to make us pure as he is pure. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are indeed the Holy One. Lord, that when the powers of darkness come up against you, they do not have even a lick of authority. Lord, we pray that for anyone in the church, for anyone who's watching, that may feel as though they have uh, some foothold which the devil is using, Lord, we pray that you would bring your power, bring your authority, bring your spirit into that situation. Lord, you are God. And God has the power to speak and creation is made. God has the power to separate light from darkness. And God also has the power to rebuke the powers of darkness. We just pray that you do this, Jesus. Amen.